Queensland State Archives for organising this amazing event and this very impressive uh, exhibition just outside these doors. But to have the people, some of the main players from this time here today, what an incredible privilege. So keep in mind that there will be an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, for the last portion of our time today. So you might want to be your own little investigative journalist and take a few notes as you go along, just to remind you is if one of our esteemed uh, panel says something that you'd like to follow up on. So we had the, the fantastic uh, introduction from the minister, so I think I'd just like to get straight into hearing from our panel. Um, perhaps if I can start with you, Chris Masters. Uh, it struck me that this, the, uh, the uh, Moonlight State was almost the story that never was in a way. You were a bit reticent to take this on to start with, weren't you? Would that be right to say? Well, there'd been a lot of reporting on alleged co police corruption in Queensland and uh, I'd seen a lot of people uh, retreat battered and bruised. Uh, so, you know, at first I thought, what, what, what's new, what's different? But, Actually, up the back there, you've got Jim Slade and Christine Slade. Uh, they were the ones that made the difference. Uh, they, I, I went and spoke to them, and when, when, when they told me their story, I realised that this was, this was about systemic corruption. You know, Jim had been offered a bribe by a superior. So all these stories you hear about police officers being bribed, sadly, are not unusual. Uh, but in this case, there was an indication that there was an architecture to it, that it was that we were looking at institutional corruption. So, but yeah, you're right. And the best, my first reaction was, oh no, not Queensland corruption again. <laughs> not another Queensland crook story. Yeah. But they never work. Yeah. What was it that, that really pushed over the line? You, you mentioned Jim Slade, of course, but uh, because it's been said that you really pulled together the links between the main players and the vice in the background. What, what enabled you to, to push this over Yeah, line? Look, it's a good point. I, you know, you, the, the popular image of uh, investigative journalism is that it's all about sources, you know, deep throats telling you things and you breathlessly rush off and report them, whereas I don't think that's the actual truth of it. It's more about working it out and, uh, uh, and pulling it all together and, and forming the narrative. So, so that, that's what that, that three months exercise was all about joining the dots. It's amazing looking back now, is it, 30 years on, what were some of your recollections, particularly as you looked at these cabinet minutes? Uh, did that bring back new memories for you? I, I, st I still shake my head a bit, you know, because uh, I didn't know about that, of course, at the time. I, I thought, you know, I was absolutely lost and lonely and about to be fried <laughs> because that's what tended to happen when you're a whistleblower. Uh, you know, the institutions close around you, uh, the, the p power politics comes into play, your witnesses get burned. Uh, but I wasn't aware that um, I had a lot more supporters than I imagined, you know. I didn't know Mike. I didn't know, I didn't know that it sounds like we shared some similar views. Um, and uh, um, uh, I didn't know that there were so many other characters. I, I think that the Bielke Peterson years were coming to an end. I think his his reign was becoming untenable. Where, and whereas that was clear to me as a result of my work, I didn't actually think that it was obviously clear to a great many other people as well. Uh, and putting it all together, seeing Four Corners mentioned in those cabinet minutes as well, yeah, was well, that, that a revelation? Yeah, that's good. I mean, mm. Journalists aren't really well regarded, and uh, but but I think, gosh, if you know we're not there to do this stuff, who will do it? I, I think uh, I'm proud to say the best thing about the Moonlight State is it demonstrates not just the power of journalism but the value of it. Um, so to see my program, still very proud of Four Corners, mentioned as being instrumental in a landmark uh, historic political event is. It is heartening. And it was not an easy ride for, for yourself or for, as you mentioned, the, the incredibly brave witnesses who, who came forward. But uh, what, can you tell us some of the, the anecdotes you, you remember from putting together the Moonlight State at the time and very late nights and it was a long haul, wasn't it? 
Well, can I trot out my tired joke? <laughs> I used to, uh, there's not much that's too funny about that experience. And, and to, still, uh, I still have mixed feelings about it. It was a very unpleasant experience. Um, but, you know, I used to say, so you'd see the Queensland police, you know, chewing on the gristle of corruption, as I put it, in the various Chinese restaurants that, that around <laughs> Roma Street. You know, they never paid for their meals, of course. Uh, and, I, and I would think to myself... Uh, well, if the AFP couldn't get them and the NCA couldn't get them, the MSG might. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of late nights and uh, I, I think I remember you saying in one of the, the State Archives interviews too that it seemed to all change, uh, really hotted up once you started filming outside a, a certain Jack Herbert's house. Uh, can you give yeah, some well, it there? was demoralising too, not just because of the nature of the work and being, uh, hearing the stories, the pitiful stories from some of these women who worked in the brothels. Who, it was like a latter-day slave trade. And the demoralisation of the, of police officers who had been press ganged into a career of corruption. You know, they didn't want to be corrupt. But that was the system. It was it was forcing them to to work for the criminals that they were supposed to be arresting. And the milieu was demoralising. Today's news is tomorrow's wrappings. People would say to me, you know, you you'll do more harm than good. Um, so that 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 made the the process particularly difficult. And of course, the day after it aired. Uh, that is in your memories too, and, and uh, you went through your diary as part of this exhibition. What do you remember of yeah. that day? I opened the diary to, to the day um, after the program went to air, and, I, and it says, I awake to the beating of my own heart. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've always had a bit of a blood pressure problem, but boy, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was at its peak then. Um, but, you know, I can remember uh, going in to do an interview on the Channel 9 Today show, whatever it's called, and uh, didn't know anything about the political reaction uh, to the program. Uh, but I remember saying it was kind of like a lament. I just just wish just for once the government would take notice and do something about this this sort of stuff. And uh, and I think Bill Gunn was thinking much the same, wasn't he? Not, and, and that's not what I would have known at the time. And this is where events do overlap somewhat. Uh, Mike O'Hearn, of course, I think in your interviews too, you mentioned that Bill Gunn was aware of uh, this story from the ABC perhaps for some time and uh, had spoken to you about that? Is, is that correct? To me. Uh, mm. Yes. Yes, he, um, he knew that Chris's program was coming up and raised the issue in Cabinet several times saying this is coming, this is coming, it's not going to be good and uh, we're going to have to respond to it and there was a lot of, oh, you know, it'll go away. And he said, it won't, you know. <clears throat> and so uh, after several occasions uh, of that sort of uh, rhetoric going out there, uh, then, then finally the program arrived. And, uh, and uh, what happened then was uh, he had a belief that something had to be done about it. Uh, he said so. <clears throat> but uh, he discovered, I'm not sure how they did that... Uh, that Bjorka Peterson was going to be over in Disney World or something, <laughs> looking at some issues relating to the expo, which was coming up in five months' time. And so uh, he uh, phoned Bob Sparks. Bob Sparks was president of the party at the time, and uh, well, he'd been there for a long time. And uh, he said, I want to come and see you. So they decided that there would be a commission of inquiry in, in response to it and, uh, and that they... Uh, he spoke with Neville Harper. Neville Harper had been Attorney General and went on to uh, do other things. <clears throat> but Neville Harper came up with the name Tony Fitzgerald. Uh, none of us had heard of him before, but uh, <clears throat> that's what had happened. 
My role was uh, quite uh, uh, outsiderish. Initially, I'm, I'm an ag scientist. I was Minister for Primary Industries for three years. I was then shuffled on to the industry technology and um, industry small business and technology, and then the health and the environment uh, to do, uh, which confronted the AIDS crisis. So, I mean, I had a lot of things on my hands which, which weren't the police. And so, um, but I had a, a role to play later, as you know. <coughs> Mike, but did the, it surprise you how quickly Bill Gunn moved on that, given well, the he events? Well, he had to either mm. do it or, or, uh, or not do it, because mm. the, the issue was Joe was away. Mm. And that's the sort of thing he would do, is, <laughs> is deal with something when when the principal player's not there. <laughs> uh, and so, so Gunn went out, the next thing I knew was Gunn went out and announced that it was going to happen. It hadn't been uh, agreed to by the Cabinet and there was held a pay apparently amongst the telephones. <coughs> and I had to get back for the Cabinet meeting. Joe was urgently coming back. <laughs> I was up in Mackay on a hospital inspection and to get there from to Roma, which was where the meeting was on, was, was not easy. But I made it, but I was late. Uh, I arrived there at midnight. Anyway, there was a lot of discussion. I had a phone call from Robert Sparks asking me to support the, the proposal. He was phoning around everybody and then the meeting took place in Roma. Why Roma? Because Roma had uh, a new uh, town clerk there who went to school with me, uh, <laughs> Peter McKenzie, and the, he had built a new civic centre there. And he said, we'll have a country cabinet here to celebrate that. And so he didn't quite know what was going on <laughs> at the time. <clears throat> but there were, uh, there were scones and and cream and one thing or another. No one uh, had many of them that morning. Uh, there was a lot of discussion going on. I, uh, uh, Sparks asked me, would I inform Bill Gunn that I had his, uh, that he had my support? I said I would do that and I did it. And so the discussion went on around the cabinet table and there was some language uninviting of gutter children fighting uh, about it. But it was too late. And so an executive council minute was circulated and the process began. I was advised by <coughs> Bill Gunn that he tried to stop it in the afternoon and that, he, that he'd had an executive council minute drafted cancelling it. But I, I was unable to prove that. But so it went on. It, it, uh, uh, it was driven by, by Bill Gunn who just simply f was fed up telling lies about prostitution and all the other things. And uh, so he went ahead and uh, then as soon as he could get the Executive Council minute from Roma to Government House, he did that. Not sure whether they flew back and then s sent the, uh, the message up to the Governor and signed it and, uh, and the rest is history. When you look back at those cabinet minutes, is that how you recall events as well, Mike? Were there some yes, aspects there that you'd forgotten? Or? Yes, those cabinet secretaries <coughs> were very accurate, very good people. Uh, they're not political players at all. They were conscious of the fact that they were always recording important history. And so that was all. I'm not sure who was the... Uh, the, the guy out in Roma on this day, I think it might have been Stuart Tate, who's a methodical, uh, very careful sort of bloke, and he would be just getting it right. That's what, what he wrote Cabinet Minister Minutes about. So did it surprise me? No, no, it was always a rich tapestry, <laughs> the, being in the <laughs> Bjorka Peterson Cabinet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And events moved pretty quickly after that. You mentioned, of course, Tony Fitzgerald. How pivotal do you think that choice was to, to head the inquiry? 
Well, I think it was very important, his appointment, and I think he sat down realising that there was a job to do and he was going to do it. And my interactions with him found him just like that. Was it a good thing having someone that really no one had heard of? There was a bit of scepticism at the time about his appointment, wasn't well, there? Well, I think it was very good. They did not want to have someone, and another name was mentioned, uh, who was known to half the Cabinet, a fellow called Pratt, whose name came up later in the dispatches before the inquiry. Uh, but it was important, I think, I felt and feel now that someone who, who just came onto it cold, as it were, was the right thing. And it, oh. Do you think that Neville Harper had a good clue that there was a lot more to Tony Fitzgerald than others realised? I don't know. I really, I haven't, it's not a discussion I've had with him, but he came up with the name and, uh, and so that's how it was. Did he have, would he have done it differently? I don't think so. I think he, uh, he was, I think, asked to select someone who, who could carry out a commission of inquiry into the police department. That's where it started uh, and do it well. And I think he just said, well, he's, he's a guy who he knew and, uh, and so, so it went on. And, of course, the Fitzgerald Inquiry would run for two years and hear from more than 300 witnesses. Did you think it would be that expansive at the start? I didn't think about it, actually. I was still Minister for Health, uh, <laughs> dealing with that, the AIDS crisis, which was uh, getting sillier by the day. Uh, but um, it didn't occur to me how long it would go, except... Someone said to me, look, these things always go longer than you think and you won't be able to stop it once it gets going, particularly if it's on the things, and you just have to see it out. And that's what, that's what had happened. Finally, Tony Fitzgerald recommended that it uh, conclude. And he, of course, um, asked for permission from you to extend the terms of reference at one point as well. Yeah, I, I think this was one of the most important decisions that have been made in recent times, was the decision by Tony Fitzgerald to come to me to ask for the extension of the terms of reference. This was um, a dynamite sort of request because uh, I said, why? And he said, because uh, there are people down in, uh, in the affected group who are going down to New South Wales <coughs> to get barristers from down there to come up and lay the argument that this is a police inquiry and if you're not a police policeman, uh, we can't examine you about anything, no matter what. And he said, I don't think uh, what I've seen, that you can restrict it to policemen. And so uh, I said, what are you asking me to do? He said, I want you to extend it so that I have broad powers. And I said, right, so that's, that's what you're saying is that you need broad powers to make whatever inquiries are necessary uh, in the interest of the state. He said, yes, that's what I am. In the, uh, I haven't looked at the actual wording, but in the Parliament in those days, you'd, to do that, you'd put and for other purposes or something like that in, in the, uh, the thing. Anyway, so I went to Cabinet uh, with an oral submission. I knew if I had a written submission, it would be circulated around all over the place and there'd be phone calls and the president of the party and this minister, that minister, someone else ringing up saying, you can't do this, you can't look out. And uh, this was never intended to be like that. So I went to Cabinet and I said, Tony Fitzgerald has asked for this to happen. You can either do it now or wait for all the, the noise to go out there and you have the newspapers telling you you have to do it because he's got good reasons, good evidence that he wants to present. 
So I said, what are you going to do? I recommend that we do it. I didn't take up a, a piece of paper at all. There was no notice given. So I asked around the table, starting with Gunn, what do you think? He said, I think you've got to do it. And then I saw Harper. I said, Harper, what do you think? He said, I think you've got to do it. I said, I don't think you've got any alternative. So if you, if you like, I'll call Tony Fitzgerald this afternoon and tell him it's on. That's the history. And uh, so that brought politicians in there who didn't ever think that they'd be able to or have to appear. All, anyone, anyone at all who was of relevance in, in the eyes of Tony Fitzgerald. And so that was a, a dramatic thing to do. It took it into a whole range of areas. And if, if you look looked at it at all, uh, it went into all sorts of government departments. As a fellow in the health department was writing out, uh, was handing out signed death certificates. There was problems over in the the, uh, the jails with, with, with fellows there. I think 70% of them had criminal records of the warders. And there was all sorts of things going on everywhere you looked. And Chris Masters, you were a bit surprised to find out you were under surveillance as well. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you can't, it kind of comes with the business. Although you know, you don't. You, you, where the when where the storyteller is not the story. You know, I, 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 I um, paranoia only takes hold when it has some real cause. Hopefully. But uh, yeah, they're, they're, um, they're, when you said um, before that there was a critical moment, and that, that obviously was when they realised that we'd made the connection mm. between the underworld and the cr cr crooked police hierarchy via the Jack Herbert property. He was the, um, the, the middleman, the joker. And uh, when our cameras were sighted outside his house, they kind of knew the gig was up. And that's, that's recorded in Lewis's diary. Um, and that's, that's also important, you know. Uh, investigative journalism ought to be about evidence. And this was irrefutable evidence, the connection between the underworld and, and the cops. Um, <clears throat> and I think probably made the biggest difference um, but after that, uh, the, we started getting followed everywhere. And uh, I can remember one occasion <laughs> making a stuff up navigation-wise as I was turning onto the, to the freeway there right along the river, you know. And as I turned in, I thought, oh, God, I've gone the wrong way. And I wondered whether I, should, uh, I could possibly back up. And, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and there was these beefy cops <laughs> sitting in this car behind me. Um, that was a bit of anti-surveillance exercise that I sort of naturally came up with. Uh, um, but yeah, there were, there were other occasions. Um, they, they, the federal police actually warned me, you know, that they, I didn't know until the last 12 months that, that my connection with the federal police wasn't so much forged by me but, but, but by them, and they were actually looking out for me because uh, they knew that the stakes were very high, and they were too. You think about it. Uh, this was a billion-dollar illicit empire. There were people who were going to go to jail. You know, people like the police commissioner. If, if, if they'd have known what was coming, you could imagine what they would have done. And so uh, the, the feds were somewhat aware of that, and they started to look out for me. And in a sense, I think that, looking back on it, was all about um, just by them having a visible protection presence, they were in a way protecting me. The Queensland cops knew they couldn't do anything too too extreme with the feds looking on. But uh, but they were they were they and they warned me that um, that you know my room would be searched and that my phone would be tapped. So I used to write these rubbish notes on on the. Uh, on the little notepads in the hotel room, and then I'd tear off the the top so that I left the imprint there, <laughs> just 
just to confuse them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, in the background to this as well, Dr. Isla Quito was the, the battle for the wet tropics. Has, how has this been looking at those cabinet minutes and knowing the battle that went into gaining the World Heritage Listing for that area and your formation of the, the Rainforest Conservation Society to ensure that as well. Yes, uh, just initially that time of the, the um, Four Corners program, couldn't help think back to about over 10 years earlier mm -hmm. when Ray Whitrod um, actually was, um, he, he wanted an inquiry into the, you know, the bashing, police bashing of uh, one of the uh, protesters, university protesters. And Joe said there wouldn't be an inquiry, but um, it, it, Ray Woodrow was uh, supported by his minister at the time. And um, so the inquiry did go ahead and it reported back uh, later that year. And the day that he announced that there would be action taken against specific police officers, he announced that he would resign because he could no longer cope with the interference from Joe and others in cabinet, um, basically constituting, you know, a huge breach in that separation of powers between the judiciary and the police force and, the, you know, and uh, the executive arm of government. And um, he could no longer countenance that and uh, and that um, the state was heading towards a police state and he had recommended, he had, uh, because uh, Lewis was going to replace the then, uh, replace him, he'd warned that he was corrupt. So it's interesting that it took over 10 years for, for you know, that to play out. <coughs> and I, I suppose, you know, just looking over that longer period from the 1960s through the 70s, there was emerging a, a um, sort of a greater environmental awareness, particularly from well, nationally and internationally, and uh, not just not just environmental awareness, but there seemed to be a, a sort of collision between old power and new power, new power, which is sort of more based on um, egalitarianism, transparency you know, openness, uh, et cetera. And uh, it, whereas we came out of, my husband and I came out of academia, we believed very naively that, you know, that facts would make a difference. And we felt that we were apolitical and that if you really believed that something was right and you had the facts behind you, that that, um, that would be convincing. But it was very hard to, uh, you know, our instinct is to negotiate with whoever is in power. But given the history, um, you know, going back to the student, the student unrest at Queensland University where we were and participating in the Springbrook, you know, um, demonstrations, being thrown over the cliffs <laughs> at Tower Mill, seeing, you know, seeing the difficulties for the repression of anyone who really um, tried to to speak out, uh, it was going to be difficult. But um, we felt that that was our major contribution was to bring science to the issue. So it was rather ironical that reading the cabinet minutes, um, they're, they're particularly in 1987, there was extensive documentation about how um, you know the nomination was totally flawed and based on uh, poor evidence, despite us having, you know, the support and assistance of scientists around the world and, and I might add, many of the scientists that the state government was relying on to refute the nomination. Yes, you mentioned that, that on your reading of the cabinet minutes, you really felt there was that ulterior motivation of protecting the government from change, so very much just under the surface there throughout. Would that be well, right? well, my naive conclusion was that 
but really overlying all of this was um, right through from the early 80s and perhaps earlier than that with, you know, the going back to the Whitlam government, the emergence of the importance of world heritage, the legislation that, you know, like the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act, uh, the composition of the High Court and the rulings of the court on, on the Franklin Dam was starting to look as though um, it, it, it seemed as though state rights was becoming a, a big issue. And so it's not surprising that Joe, I think, who had an extraordinary obsession with uh, retaining power at whatever cost, um, would fight very much against, uh, you know, to preserve state rights. But I also noticed in, in those minutes that uh, they saw the agitation within the community, particularly um, given that it had been so uh, you know, successful at a national basis with the opposition to the Franklin Dam, that this would just be the thin edge of the wedge. The next thing would be the, you know, would be Morton Island and Fraser Island and, you know, a whole lot of other issues, which actually did turn out to be true. So it was, um, you know, shut the door now or never. But also, I think there was a, there was, I felt, um, an inordinate focus on, on development, particularly sort of in the agricultural and mining sector, which is a little bit surprising, given that at the opening of the 1980 uh, conference in Cairns, it was a world wilderness conference and. Job spoke at that, and he he discussed the in in glowing terms the significance of the wet tropical rainforests as a literally a, a an unparalleled you know living museum that had to be protected. So there were those dichotomies. <laughs> yes. They're all intersecting at the time. And uh, I remember you saying that you felt at that time really conservation ended up with what was left from all the extractive industries really. Has that changed now and looking back, do you think? Oh, look, I think that uh, protection of the environment wherever you are in the world has always been a struggle. I think that there, there is undoubtedly, irrefutably, that tension between conservation and development uh, and a lack of realisation that, you know, uh, nature's fate is ours and that we have to protect the whole environment um, globally, otherwise, you know, societies and economies in the longer term won't survive. And I think we're seeing that with the, you know, the prospect of... of um, uh, and dramatic impacts of climate change. And so, yes, I do think that it was, it was always a struggle and you tended to be left with the, the best of the last after everyone. And they tended to be in areas that were inaccessible for development. Is largely. there a, a, a danger as time goes on that people forget the battle that, that it took to get wet tropics. I imagine many young people probably think that it's just always been a World Heritage listed area, when in fact it was a 10-year tussle, really, between the, the federal government and, and the state government and, yes. and environmentalists, wasn't yes. it? There's no such thing as, as forever. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, I think things come in, in cycles and that you... Um, you know, that, that whatever gains you had in the future will again be threatened, which is why it's so important that, you know, community awareness is, is maintained so that people do uh, appreciate the proper role of the environment in um, one's lives. Uh, I don't think there's anyone here who, if they visit um, natural areas, isn't somehow affected and in their hearts would believe they need to be protected, <coughs> but there does end up being uh, some, um, you know, sort of immediate choices because it requires two types of thinking. One is the here and now, which is about um, 
you know, money for school, you know, um, being able to support yourself as opposed to thinking in the very long term, that relational thinking that, that makes you uh, aware, like in, you know, in considering the tragedy of the commons, that um, <coughs> one, has to, one has to think about the greater good in the longer term. And sometimes that does ma <coughs> mean that you have what appear to be sacrifices. So, um, yes, I don't, I don't think... I think there's always a danger that we become <coughs> complacent. And I think particularly uh, today, I think it's becoming even more difficult because what, what seems to be failing is the, the traditional, deliberative, analytical uh, media that, that actually you, you could rely on um, for alerting you to issues with the you know, fundamental facts supporting that. And I think it has become very superficial. There's a greater reliance on social media. And um, social media, for all its benefits, it also has downsides, which means that people often, there are very large numbers of people that just um, uh, hear what they want to hear and operate in a bubble and are easily manipulated as the recent example of, what was it, the Cambridge Can Analytica. Yes. Yeah. And, and now I think emerging some of the aspects of, um, you know, Facebook and um, how there's been complicit sort of interactions um, and use of private data um, from vulnerable people who don't actually avail themselves of facts. So I think there is a danger uh, for all of us. And I think... Um, it is That's interesting tough. seeing all of those strings draw together and to, to get a full picture of that background and to remind ourselves that anniversaries like this, exactly how, how intricate it was. I rem you mentioned the, the protests at the time. That's certainly something I remember, even as a, a teenager, and just felt like there were protests constantly, that there was this air of um, wariness, I think, of, of being in public with any sort of radical view, that it was a, a really quite a big political... <laughs> choice. Um, Mike, for you, you also, it uh, reminds me of a t one time you mentioned again in your interview about coming into conflict with Joe regarding uh, your work in the AIDS sphere over the uh, condom vending machines, I believe, at uh, the universities. Could you tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> yes, certainly. The, uh, I was appointed Minister for Health and Environment in 1986. And by that time, the AIDS epidemic was just starting to arrive. And uh, so the health department uh, spoke to me about the difficulties that, that this was going to present. There was a national AIDS task force. They wanted us to be part of it. And uh, that there was potentially a very large problem in the indigenous population and uh, that, uh, that they would be decimated unless something constructive was done. And so I, uh, with my science background, I suppose I knew what was going on and I, I went 100% full on with the requests that were made, and it, which meant uh, a fair bit of conflict. It did around the world, incidentally, because it was some, somehow a, a moral issue. Somehow or other people invented it. Apart from a public health measure, they, uh, which it was, they saw it as some, something of a moral issue, a biblical issue, and so on. And so it, it was... Uh, but it wasn't an issue for me. I just had no problems with it at all. And we went, I went ahead to do whatever had to be done. We went to the National AIDS Task Force. I was a member of uh, one of their committees. And <coughs> Dr Ken Donald was appointed to be part of that. And so we went ahead and did what we had to do. But we were, I was regularly reminded by Bjorka Peterson that he said, your job's easy. He said, do you know what you have to do? Nothing. <laughs> I said, oh, that, yeah. that won't do me. And he said, well, I, 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 I. 
<laughs> so anyway, we went ahead, and from time to time he'd have a go at me, and uh, he really hated the condom vending machine thing. There was a couple of them out there at the university, and the courier mail, I think, had identified these things there, and Joe said to me, what are you going to do about it? And I said, uh, nothing. <laughs> and he said, if they're not down by five o'clock today, you won't be there tomorrow. So I had to think as to whether that was what I needed to be kicked out of the ministry for, was whether it was important enough, whether it was going to be good publicity, mm -hmm. bad publicity, a joke or whatever. And I said, no, well, OK, they'll come down. So I said to the Director General, I want you to get a couple of policemen who are very tall, <laughs> awkward, overweight, <laughs> and I want them to go down to the Mitre 10 and buy crowbars. No, none of this five foot business, I want six foot <laughs> crowbars. <laughs> He said, I think I've got your message. So, <laughs> so these blokes went out to the university there and, um, and it went, the, the story of this and the absolute theatre of the absurd, which it was, went all over the world. It was a feature on CNN. <laughs> so he left me alone for a while. <laughs> but there were some other things came up from time to time. One, uh, on one occasion he said to me, Mike, do you realise the Catholics hate you? <laughs> and uh, being a Catholic, I said, I don't, I don't think that's right. Yes, he said, yes. I said, well, why don't we go out and ask the public or the churches what they think? Well, yes, yeah, well, well. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, are you sure? Yeah, 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 you, boy, you'll get the shock of your life. <laughs> So we went out and we, I announced that this, that we wanted, the cabinet wanted the churches to stand up and say what they thought about the AIDS crisis and what we were doing about it. And so the first one out there was uh, the, uh, who was the first one? Oh, the Uniting Church. They've got a very good social ministry and I knew what their attitude would be. Strong support. So the next ones were the Lutherans. <laughs> the Lutherans. Yeah. Uh, Joe's own people, yeah. 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 So they were strongly supportive too. And then, then there was the guy from the uh, church, the Anglican church, a really lovely man. He, uh, he came out in full robes, cap, everything, to announce that they had thought about it and prayed about it and they'd decided that it was a public health measure, measure and the minister had to do what he had to do. And then came the Catholics. <laughs> yeah. Archbishop Frank Rush. To this day, I swear to you, I didn't ring him. I could have rung him, <laughs> but I didn't have to. I sort of thought, this this will be all right. And it was, he just said the same. Yeah. And so the only people who, who voiced any concern on the other side were, were the uh, Episcopal churches who were concerned. But they needn't have been. But at the end of it, the, I don't think we had any deaths amongst our Indigenous people. It was because of a lady called Graceland Smallwood, who some of you know, who was a really uh, top of line nurse, uh, Indigenous person. And we got together with her, that the department did, and I think we saved uh, enormous lives with, with what we did there. And uh, elsewhere, he was still dogging me about it, and so what we did was we got Sister Angela Mary. Sister Angela Mary used to run the Sisters of Mercy here in Queensland, the Mater Hospital, and she would uh, go around the hospital there in a tin hat dare you disagree with her <laughs> and so we said she'll do and so we gave we gave her the job of administration of the health matters so that whoever liked could take her on <laughs> and uh, she did a great job 
and she worked with people, she worked with homosexual people, drug users and those sorts of people. And uh, the, the results were excellent. And uh, there, is, there is a lot of uh, opinion around that what we did here was not only do a good job, but we were the best in the country. <laughs> we saved a lot of lives and uh, it was... Uh, it was a victory for common sense. But of course, that wasn't the last time that Joe asked for your resignation, was it, Mike? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was. Uh, the, there had been a uh, <clears throat> a very serious matter relating to the world's tallest building, which had created quite a, a bit of concern. Anyway. Uh, uh, there was a fellow who was a member for the, maybe this district, Springwood, uh, Fraser. And uh, he, uh, he got to hear about the world's tallest building and believed that it would, was not a, an honest deal. And so he stood up in the party room and called uh, Joe, corrupt hole, so and so. And uh, so he left Joe and never came back. And so Fraser stood up on that occasion. And later on, uh, then he decided if it couldn't get it through the party room, couldn't get it through the parliament, the Brisbane City Council didn't want to know about it. So he would have to reorganise the cabinet put some people in who would be uh, in agreement with anything he put up and uh, <clears throat> and then pass it under his under some legislation he had there in the coordinated general's department and so uh, to do that he felt he had to get rid of five of us gun Austin myself McKechnie and uh, Muntz. And then he was going to appoint some others who would be uh, complicit. And so uh, we had to go. I got to hear about it and uh, when I went up to, uh, to see him, he, he summoned me up there and he said, uh, Mike, I want your resignation and threw, threw it down, sign it. I said, you, won't have, you can't have it. He said, why? I said, you don't get your, a resignation without a reason. What's the reason? He said, I don't have to give it to you. Mm -hmm. I can do it without that. <laughs> I said, well, you can't have my resignation. You can sack me. That's OK. You can do that. But unless you give reasons adequate, then, then I won't resign. But I said, if you do that, if you say that's what you're going to do, keep your eye on that TV because I'm going to walk out of here now and I'm going to challenge you for the leadership of the party. And he got eight votes. And that was the turning point. Yeah. Premier and Michael. he told you beforehand that he was the party, isn't he? <coughs> That's right. He said to, I said to him on the way out, I said, the National Party won't be happy. He said, I am the National Party. <laughs> And uh, there was mention of the joke just before as well, Chris Masters, which made me think of, of uh, your work in this and exposing the joke. When did the absolute expanse of that really hit you? Like, even when the Fitzgerald Inquiry was ongoing, did the tentacles of it surprise you or did you really have a pretty good idea by then? No, I, I, can, remember, I can remember working it out and I can remember um, talking about it in detail. Uh, I remember also meeting the Joker. Uh, I had some extraordinary meetings subsequent to doing all this work. One with Flo Bielke peterson I've got a copy of her book at home with the pumpkin scone recipe and her signature in it. And Joe, she, she wasn't a big fan of Joe's business skills, I can tell you. Uh, but the, uh, but the, the, also with uh, Jack Herbert, uh, an amazing meeting with him down on the Gold Coast. His wife sort of glaring at me from, from the kitchen. But he was, he hadn't really taken it personally. 
um, and uh, he, he, he told me, you know, in, in great detail about how he used to go along to the police award ceremonies and while they were getting their awards for being brave and honest coppers, he, he'd, he'd give them their sling as well. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Doesn't this, this show that, um, you know, none, none of these outcomes that we're talking about today were guaranteed. They, they really depended on specific individuals who were able to uh, recognise windows of opportunity, who were there and had the ability to think creatively, like Mike, um, and it's sort of, you know, tying in with that, with, um, you know, the Fitzgerald inquiry, just, just how um, accidental some things are. For example, Joe was away in Disneyland. I love the imagery. And the, so Gunn was able to, you know, seize that opportunity. But also, at the time, that Joe was overseas, and this was just after he'd he'd announced Joe for PM, if I'm um, correct, is that about, around about the same time? Um, earlier. Bob, earlier than yeah. pardon? Earlier, earlier, earlier. in '87. <coughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes, but but that but, came into <coughs> it as well. Yes, mm. but but you know that that uh, uh, caused the 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 federal at Queensland's uh, National Party members federally to break the coalition agreement. So government was in disarray, and so Bob Hawke was able to capitalise on this that disunity and call a snap election, and Joe happened to be away at the time and wasn't able to register as a candidate for the election, so he ended up pulling out, and then there were these three-cornered contests that meant that um, Hawke won, won the unwinnable election because he was losing support. There were, so, you know, it does show how tenuous, I guess, and um, luck comes into things and being able to seize windows of opportunity. So it does come out, down to remarkable people who yeah. see those windows. Can I say something there? Mm. Yeah, I, I think we've found out since that there was a... <clears throat> the Australian Federal Police back in the late 70s was aware of the uh, corruption business uh, going on here and uh, set about a, a couple of officers to investigate it and to catalogue it all. And uh, they did that. One of them is living on Bribey Island now, I think, or, or is it uh, uh, Redcliffe? So he's still there and can verify this, but but he so he was given the job of collating all of this. So back then it was all known and it, it was made of a file about that thick, and then that was all uh, sent up and handed to the Solicitor General here in Queensland. And uh, the file sat on the desk there for a while. It set it set out all of these things, which Tony Fitzgerald turned up were known by the Australian Federal Police before and presented in writing to the Queensland Government. And uh, someone came in and put it all through the shredder. Mm. Well, there used to be... There were serious uh, national drugs inquiries going on involving the National Crime Authority and uh, the National Crime Authority investigators as soon as they engaged with the Queensland Police, you know, it would all d die because, you know, they hid the evidence. Uh, and um, Justice Stewart, the NCA director, came up to have a personal briefing with the Attorney General to try to fix this, and that's when they knew in, in Canberra that, that corruption didn't end with, uh, with Terry Lewis. And as you mentioned too, the role of ordinary Australians in this, Chris, uh, that you were really struck by the circumstances of some of the people that you interviewed, the, the ordinariness of their very Australian existence, but to be caught up in, in that web. Yeah, well, you know, I find it encouraging, basically, that 
the system worked. I mean, Mike stood up for decent values, not, you know, and that goes against party lines often. Um, and, and I think jo good journalism is about good citizenship. And I was proud to be joined in a citizenship exercise with Jim and Christine Slade, who didn't like what had been happening to them. And I, I even give credit to those brothel keepers and, and uh, drug dealers who took a great risk and stood up and gave evidence to the Fitzgerald inquiry, uh, expecting that they'd be thrashed for doing it. But they showed good citizenship and some courage too. 30 years on, are you um, still amazed that, that, that you can consistently are being asked questions about the Moonlight State, the, 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 the fascination that people seem to have with this story? Yes, because most of what we do is ephemeral and you, you don't expect it to stick. I actually do think that the, the best journalism is the stuff that is remembered, that yeah. goes into history. And, you know, my mother was a great journalist and a very humble, modest country town journalist. But I just noticed over the years that people had come and talked to her about stories she'd written 20, 30 years ago. And I thought, well, you know, that's better than getting any kind of award. Um, having your work remembered. And for you to, uh, Isla, the, the, I imagine that the army of ordinary people that were involved in, in the battle for the, for the wet tropics as well and for, for getting that. Absolutely essential. I think um, in some ways, you know, that little trite saying that politicians are best at counting, you know, at the counting, which meant counting votes, is true. And I think often they're not moved. I think you know, visionary politicians are few and far between, and it often is about, you know, how do you stay in power? And so, you know, public, su public <coughs> support is, is vital for, for change. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, that's what, that's what societies are supposed to be, that we elect politicians to look after the issues that matter to us in a responsible way. And I think what better society than one where we feel good about being alive, we, we feel good about our governments and we have some confidence in the future that you know, matters are being you know, addressed that need to be addressed. So uh, that's where the public, in the end, I think, you know, of all the, uh, the key substitutions that organise you know, societies and that's your, your political, um, you know, infrastructure, economic infrastructure and social, which is the community and, and you know, the press and uh, etc. cetera. Um, the most powerful in the end, as revolutions tell us, is that social pillar. Mm. Is there a danger of complacency now? You mentioned in the interviews that you felt like a lot of the the rights that you'd fought for had really been wound back? Um, I don't know that it's complacency. I think it's, it's just a sign of the times that um, the, there are forces that keep people preoccupied with short term rather than being able to look at the long term. And, uh, but things come in cycles. I think, you know, there's a level of tolerance when things get so... The, the pity is that we often have to have our backs against the wall before there's enough, you know, uh, drive to change things. That's the pity. Because um, when that's the case, so much is lost in the process. And, Michael Hearn, can you see uh, the change from... Brisbane was always referred to as that big country town. Uh, do you see the, the change there looking back now as well? Yes, certainly. It, it was <clears throat> a major change maker for Queensland and that was the way we saw it. When my government came to power, we said this is going to be um, the change process for us. We'll do things differently. and. Uh, the Fitzgerald process will be a lot about what we do to achieve that. And so uh, 
and we did it. And uh, we got a fair bit done. And it's been continued since then, and the change process has been worthwhile and quite dramatic, and it's ongoing. And I just want to take the opportunity here where, um, to, to say to Chris that, that it's a thankless task we all do from time to time, and yours was probably in that category, but I say to you, unless you had done what you did, it may not have happened. Yeah. Is that something that you feel comfortable with now, Chris? You have mentioned in the past the, the battles with litigation that came for so many years after uh, the, the, this very pivotal story, the Moonlight State. But can you see now the, the esteem that, uh, that your work and the work of the the people that you interviewed has made now? I don't quite know what to say. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I, it's wonderful to, to hear that. I, I really don't, I really can't uh, t take credit though. I, I mean, I know, I know I did my job. You know, I don't believe journalists ought to uh, be that interested in the outcome, frankly. I think we can't have it both ways. I loathe the Alan Jones approach to imagining that they are the, 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 the true power holders and that, mm -hmm. that, they, that they, it's their role to affect the outcome when they're not elected. I'm not not elected. My job I is to inform the public as best I can and hope the system works. And uh, of all the programs I've done over the years, even though at the time it was it seemed like the most discouraging. Looking back on it now, it, it, there, there is considerable encouragement too because, of, because the system worked. The fourth estate worked. And you, of course, had to give evidence during a Fitzgerald inquiry. That was quite um, worrying for you at the time. Would that be well, I, I, well, I, I called it my death by a thousand courts, not the Fitzgerald inquiry, <laughs> but the, the litigation. You know, it's, uh, I, I sort of shake my head a bit to think that, God, they went after me, you know, 13 years in court. Imagine what it would have been like if I was actually wrong, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or is it that you get punished for being right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this may be a good time to throw to our wonderful <coughs> audience, hopefully, uh, we may have some questions from the insights that we've had today. So we've got uh, two roaming mics. Uh, if you could possibly... Oh, we've got one roaming mic. Uh, we do have a roaming mic of some description. If you could possibly put your hand up and uh, thank you. And uh, if you could address your question as well. Thank you. Um, question for Mike. Um, you mentioned taking a proposal to Cabinet as an oral submission to fend off um, an ambush. Is that a standard practice? Because there were a number of controversial Cabinet decisions that were oral submissions. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, the second thing is there were a number of decisions made whenever Joe was out of Queensland and they were always rescinded as soon as he returned. Why was this different? Was it just a case, as you mentioned, that Bill Gunn had just had enough of the lies? What changed from the 70s, the early 80s, through to 87, that there were sufficient cabinet members who said, we're not gonna continue along this line? Yeah, the first one <coughs> is, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I did it very often, but this one uh, I knew that if that I, number one I had to do it because uh, we'd have had a, if once people started to say you can't examine me because you're not because I'm not a policeman, there'll be such a kerfuffle about that that you'll eventually have to do it. So you might as well get on with it early, and so. And the other cabinet mem members understood that. That's the way the that's the way of the world was. Particularly with these 
uh, very nasty uh, issues. Did I like to think I didn't do them so often, <laughs> but occasionally you, in life you've got to do what you've got to do. And uh, this had that desired effect. This took the politicians into into the loop, and it was a, it was probably the the most significant decision I've had to make because I knew what was coming. Um, as for Joe coming back and turning things around after he came back, yes, it was, uh, it was very interesting times, weren't they? <laughs> uh, any other questions? I hope so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, my question's for Chris. Um, are you concerned about the future of investigative journalism in this sort of era of post-truth politics? <laughs> yes, I, I am concerned. I've always been concerned, of course. Um, but uh, it's the old business model of journalism has, has failed and, and uh, we've got to find a new way to fund uh, expensive journalism. I mean, as a freelancer, for example, if I commissioned to write a 4,000-word piece for any newspaper, the best they would pay me would be a dollar a word, and they will pay me the same amount, a dollar a word, whether I do no research or a lot of research. So that's why the, the papers are full of, you know, profiles of pop stars and things that cost no, no time, research time at all. And... Um, um, you know, so you, you're actually punished for doing research, which is absurd. I, I think they'll miss us when we're gone, so, but it feels to me like it'll take a generational change for us to find a new way. I don't, I don't uh, really see the answer in citizen journalism because um, the citizen just can't afford it. I mean, the Moonlight State was made with enormous research assistance. I had a producer, I had a, a researcher who was a trained lawyer working with me. Um, we had a phalanx of lawyers looking after us and, uh, you know, we, had, we faced up to <coughs> millions of dollars of legal costs and I just can't see that happening anymore. And I'm, I'm bothered by the, the, the digital age that seems to place the moron alongside the qualified commentator and so it's forcing people to become their own gatekeepers and work it out for themselves and I think that's happening. I'll bet you it's happening with you. I had a dinner last night with a young student and I was really surprised at how astute he was at being discriminating in his own reading of the news. And I think this is probably automatically happening with a younger generation. They can, they can smell bullshit just like a good investigative journalist and they're having to work it out for themselves. But, as I say, they'll miss us when we're gone. Oh, this is a comment, I guess, for Mike more than anything. I was a student at Queensland Uni when the... Uh, condom vending machines were posted up on the wall and uh, being uni students are very creative and I noticed that above one it had the sign saying don't buy this chewing gum it's too tough <laughs> <laughs> so I thought well finally we've got it you know I'm thinking well maybe there's a hope for my sex life and then suddenly they'll pull down and I thought well that's the end of that <laughs> <laughs> the two gentlemen, Terry Lewis, how the hell did he ever get into the position? He, he, he obviously wasn't squeaky clean when he came in and there wasn't that much of a background check. So was it the corrupt people that backed him? What, what was his qualifications for the job as commissioner? He, he was there to defend the status quo. Yeah, he, he jumped from, he was about 160th in line, wasn't he? And Whitrod himself was appalled and said so publicly. Um, and I, I think Lewis was, well, he wasn't even a really good crook, you know. Uh, uh, 
he was a pretty ordinary crook, uh, but uh, and that they just wanted somebody who'd be uh, compliant, and he fitted the bill. Uh, yeah, <coughs> I'd like to say about that that the uh, the appointment was made back in the days of the coalition, and um, uh, they had somehow or other sought the view, a couple of Liberals had sought the view of Scotland Yard on uh, Lewis and uh, the, the word that came back from Scotland Yard was, we've had a look at that bloke and he's corrupt, don't appoint him. It was not uh, diluted in any way, it was blunt. Don't do it. And um, <clears throat> So why was he there? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's just Fitzgerald and his report has, has made a, a very important uh, recommendation about the appointment of a, of a police commissioner to make sure that the, the person with best merit is appointed rather than just some bloke who uh, was... Uh, rolled into the job because the, the uh, people wanted him, the joke wanted him. It wasn't accidental that they met out at Roma. That was going on a long time before then. Uh, there was a fellow called Murphy who was part of the joke. He was lobbying for him all over the place for months before that. And so his importance was, uh, it, it was very important to the business of the criminal gang. <coughs> uh, Mike, can I pick up a point you made then about the business and raise it between us? Sorry? Uh, the business community, as, a, as in you know, the commercial business community, how did they respond to life under the government, under Joe, and then Chris, life post Joe. I mean, they can't all have been bad. There must have been some interesting issues around ethics in the business community that were going on at the time. What do they think of me? Is that what you say? No, just in general, what do you think? What is your impression of how business dealt with the issues of government in the way it was being conducted at the time? Well, I think they try hard to um, get it right, is my experience of it. <coughs> and I was Minister for Industry, so I met them a lot. And I, I think they're trying hard. They don't want shortcuts. They don't like favourites and white shoes and things like that. They want a reasonable approach to things and to business policy. Because that was the problem with corruption. It wasn't just a moral issue. It was a practical issue as well. And I, on my sense was that the business community were becoming progressively outraged by the, the cronyism because what it meant at the end of the day was some unlovely crook from Singapore who could pull together $500,000 was going to get a contract over and above people who really knew how to build something. because I like living dangerously. <laughs> I'm one of the people who accidentally saw some of the Fitzgerald inquiry documents that are held here and subsequently received a letter to say I can no, cannot publish, copy, distribute the material I saw. What I saw in that, those documents made me think how much more is there in me and these are now closed as a result of an administrative decision. I'd like to know if it, all three of you, just your views, would there be any purpose in keeping those closed? Because they still, you know, 30 years down the track, tell us so much about Queensland society at that time and, and so much about attitudes towards law and order. It's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've heard of this before. I don't know what's in those, but that, that was done on the recommendation of the Commissioner. 
So it would have been done for the reasons of personal safety or some issue like that of people making information available for the commissioner but concerned with their own safety or something like that. And uh, my view would be um, to respect well, the commissioner's recommendation. I don't think there's anything in there that uh, that needs to be out in the public domain unless unless what you've said changes that. But that's where it came from. It didn't come from us. We didn't see um, the information that came forward. There was an awful lot of it, wasn't there? There were judges, remember, to, there were judges, that were, there was one judge uh, discharged. That's been the subject of another hearing, and the, the hearing has um, determined that that should be dismissed. The Fitzgerald inquiry, of course, didn't uncover everything. It, it never was going to be able to. Um, I, I still give it enormous credit for doing what it did, which was which was landmark in the time, and I think set a new standard for for royal commissions. You know, I think the prior to Fitzgerald, the presumption was that if they, if a government called a royal commission, they expected they already understood the outcome. Whereas you look at uh, the the banking royal commission today, the, the child abuse one. And I think the public's got a whole new regard for them, and I think they've developed the expertise too. I think that um, there is a time issue, as indicated here, that if there are risks to, uh, you know, undue risks to individuals, then I think it should be just a matter of time, because in the end, openness and accountability is um, fundamental to the health of, um, you know, a democracy and society. But um, there are things I ended up working very closely with, um, uh, you know, bureaucracy within and politicians as well in the federal government and in the Queensland government. But I I could not write um, a history currently uh, talking about anything because of the vulnerability to some people who are still alive. Um, the danger is I'll die before you know, yeah. before they do. But but there are lessons to be learned, important yeah. lessons, yeah. and the old adage of you know. Unless you hear history, you're bound to repeat it. Um, it's probably true. So I'd agree with you that it's really important um, that there be, uh, you know, public access, but in the appropriate time frame, if it helps. But um, oh, there was something else I was going to say. I I think it was a shame. Um, I think it was a decision of. Um, the Commissioner for the State Archives that led to the shredding of the special branch files. And I think that that was a pity. Pardon? Am I wrong? It wasn't the archivist. no. Um, well, there was a decision to, to shred them. And I think that was, that was a big mistake. Um, however, that came about because, um, again, there, there are lessons to be learned. And I don't know whether some of them still survive, but um, I was uh, one box. Yes, I was told that I was also followed and um, um, was a subject of special branch, yeah. but I never got to see my father. Chris, it makes me think of you, you, one thing you mentioned about this Royal Commission, and you said it's sort of set up the, the standards for Royal Commission since, but before that, there was a sense that Royal Commissions were only set up to look into things they already knew about, but this. Mm -hmm. This was, was different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think a, a new standard was set, and um, and it is problematic going, prosecuting through those old files because a lot of the time, what you're looking at is intelligence and information that's not provable evidence, and so there are lots of reasons why there there ought to be checks and balances. I just know about the special branch file. <coughs> I had a special branch file. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, 
I had a look at it, and uh, and the only thing you could say about it was it was blithering incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't believe the error. It was totally useless. It was ostensibly there to protect uh, my own personal safety and that of my family. It was totally useless. <laughs> This one is for Mr. Hone, really. Myself, Jenny Mendes, and Sue Horton had the privilege to read the minutes for the last couple of years. And one of the things this year we were quite interested in is the minutes around Fitzgerald. Um, but from memory, there was about three or four cabinet minutes in total talking about Fitzgerald in cabinet, which indicates to me that there must have been a hell of a lot of discussions going on outside the cabinet and maybe with select people. Have you got any views on that? Mm. Um, yes, uh, there, there must have been. I, look, there was not a lot of cabinet discussion because there was not need to be, probably. I was, um, I made myself minister because there was, early on in my career as a Premier, there was so much leaking to the media going on on a daily basis that was not helpful uh, to the work or, or whatever, and it was just a big problem. So I made myself the minister so that I could have some control over that, and, and so that the commission could do the work without. I'm talking about the build up to in 87, not after your premiership. Uh, so <coughs> when Jock Peterson was still premier, nothing. In no, well, all the, the, my recall, it's 30 years, it's getting hard, but um, I, there wasn't much discussion except uh, Bill Gunn would occasionally raise a matter and say, listen, this is, this fellow's uh, getting around a lot and he's got a lot of information and he's going to produce a lot of people uh, are going to be proven to be liars and uh, it's going to be hard, what are we going to do? Hand ringing. That's all, to my knowledge. As I said, the decision to appoint the commission was made outside of cabinet. Mm -hmm. he, he did that on the basis that he was acting premier and could act on behalf of the government. Yes. Oh, I've got a question uh, for Mike. I think your, your comment to Chris earlier was quite poignant. Uh, about his role in uh, Sunshine State. You're actually the second Premier I've witnessed do that. I, I sat next to Peter Beatty. <coughs> he did a similar thing with Chris and said how it changed the state for the better. Of course, Chris is a very humble man. Is Do you think he gets the due recognition for his role? Perhaps will we see a Chris Masters freeway or something? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hearn, you mentioned um, Murphy a little while ago, Tony Murphy. I'm wondering if he might be one of the uh, elements you were talking about, Chris, that perhaps that Fitzgerald inquiry may never have done everything, you know. W were there many other people who were so central to the joke who were pretty well got away with it? Well, I mean, I think actually Lewis was sub subordinate to Murphy yeah. and maybe a few others as well because they didn't want a too high profile crook, you know, running the show. They needed somebody that, that would pass muster and do what they were told. Uh, but uh, the rumors that swirled around Murphy were, were pretty serious. And, uh, and, you know, it's hard work. It's hard work finding witnesses 
who have got the courage to actually give evidence that that can, um, you know, because lives are at, at risk. Uh, so that that was always the whisper that um, Fitzgerald didn't go too far far enough, didn't really go beyond Brisbane and the Gold Coast, didn't really go into the drugs trade, didn't really go into the history of of murder. You know, uh, I used to say that um, in Queensland we got a Royal Commission in Victoria, they got a mini-series, you know, <laughs> uh, underbelly, because, you know, that, that police sanctioned murder was a, a real matter of fact, you know, that, that uh, across Australia, people forget just how extraordinary it was in the 1980s. You, you think of Mick Drury, the New South Wales police officer, nursing a toddler in the kitchen and he gets shot down uh, in Chatswood in Sydney. I mean, you know, you'd think that sort of stuff would happen in Colombia. From my own experience, I was more than conscious on plenty of occasions of informants doing dirty deals with the cops and then the cops realising that they were a risk because they, if, they, if a Royal Commission came along and gave them an indemnity, they would give up the cops. So they would leak information to rival criminals that so-and-so had been an informant to the cop and this bloke would get murdered. And uh, it was very, very hard to prove who was behind it. But you, you, you know, the Hodson family in Victoria, uh, under police protection, executed in their kitchen, you know, uh, I'm absolutely sure the police were behind that. Maybe, maybe this is a naive comment, but, but maybe that's the skill of um, Tony Fitzgerald, is to know where to set the limits. Because if the inquiry had uh, been, uh, you know, continued for a lot longer, would there have been a different result? Would the politics have changed? So um, I think, I think, um, that might be another aspect of not expecting to solve everything at once. Can I say something about <coughs> the Federal Narcotics Bureau, which was abolished after a Royal Commission? Uh, a Queenslander headed it up, and that that Federal Narcotics Bureau was wound up. The person who did the inquiry as to whether it should be wound up did not travel down to Canberra to interview anyone. And there were two people whose charges were ready to go to court on drugs charges called <coughs> Allahan and Murphy. And when, when the bureau was wound up, there was no one to prosecute their cases, so it lapsed. Uh, probably a question to Chris. Uh, it would appear from the Cabinet minutes that the advice that the Cabinet received was that there was no legal way of getting Jack Herbert back from Britain. Um, if the Joker didn't come back, how far do you think Tony Fitzgerald would have got? Um, a lot of others had also rolled over. You know, that was also unique about the Fitzgerald inquiry, this indemnity process that I thought worked very well, although, you know, he was seriously criticised for it, and there are a lot of police officers to this day that, would, you know, think it's outrageous that, J that Herbert wasn't jailed. Um, but, um, yeah, wouldn't have got his father. Uh, you know, he, he was a key to it, but I've always had a bit of a suspicion he could have said a bit more too. I mean, the condition of his indemnity was that if he didn't tell the full truth, he would go to jail. Well, he was a slippery character, and I think he managed his way through that. He, he wanted to come back. He said he, from, a, from his room, he could see the people that were walking up and down in black hats. Uh, Tony Fitzgerald told me that um, there was a price on his head, $1. <laughs> so, whoever did it wanted the advertising. <laughs> so he was pleading to come home. <laughs> <laughs>
The question was, how did you get him home? Qantas didn't want to know about him. <laughs> so that was uh, Bob Fawkes. Bob Fawkes, yeah. Went down in there. Yeah, and, uh, and he was an impossible uh, witness to be held in protection because he, he, uh, he, he missed his family so much that he used to hang a big beach towel outside the unit where they had him holed up so his family could find him and they'd go around looking for this beach towel and, and, and the, the cops had a lot of trouble figuring out how come the family kept finding him <laughs> they kept him away from the phones and all that. Well, this may be a good point, I think, to, uh, to, to wrap up and to, to give the last word to our amazing guests. Could we perhaps hear from you what you feel the lasting legacy of this era was that we're looking back on today and the changes that we've seen since? No. Oh, maybe stretching a bit too far, but I sort of think of the Fitzgerald thing as a bit of a Eureka stockade for Queensland. It was a catalyst for significant change, and that's one of the big reasons why it's so well remembered. I would agree. <clears throat> and I think it's been most worthwhile. There were a lot of prosecutions made, a lot of changes put in place. The opportunity was taken to make the most of the climate of change which was offered. And I think uh, it's been a great benefit. And I wanted to uh, just say to <clears throat> the people here from uh, this august organisation here, that I would like you today to accept a gift from me, which is Tony Fitzgerald's personal copy to me of, of the uh, inquiry.